excellent, but my decision to leave academia, uh, in the last two years, I noticed things were starting to go a bit weird in, in terms of the climate. And in terms of mainstream media, I was seeing piece after piece about transgender kids and how young children were socially transitioning, getting on blockers, um, pubertal, pubertal blockers. Mm -hmm. And the media was basically saying this is the greatest thing. This is something that we should rejoice about, that these kids are so much better off after. But from a scientific perspective, the research actually shows that the majority of kids who are gender dysphoric actually outgrow their feelings. They're more likely to grow up to be gay in adulthood, not transgender. And so it makes sense for them to wait, not for them to socially transition at a young age. So I wanted to write um, a mainstream piece about this. And there's been a very long standing history between trans activists and uh, sex researchers, a very ugly history of activists going after sex researchers if they don't like what someone's study says or what they say publicly. So I thought about it for a long time. I wrote the piece and I sat on it probably for about six months and I wasn't sure if I wanted to put it out. Mm -hmm. I asked a bunch of my colleagues and mentors and they all said, you know what, the science is solid, but you know, you know what's gonna happen if you do put this out. And at the time I wanted to stay in academia and I said, should I wait till I get tenure? And everyone told me, even if you have tenure nowadays, it's not gonna protect you. You can still lose your job. So I decided eventually I couldn't stay quiet and I thought I'm not gonna stay in an environment where I can't speak the truth and I can't even pursue questions that are meaningful anymore because I have to worry about who's gonna get mad mm -hmm. and then I'm gonna lose my money, my funding, and I'm gonna lose my job. So that piece went out. Uh, it was called Why Ch Transgender Kids Show Way to Transition and then I haven't looked back since. Yeah, so I reread, I've read the piece before, but I reread it this morning before Thank you. you got here. And right, there, there's a lot here. So how much of this is just, blat is just blatantly a misunderstanding of science? Like, I think there's partly that you have a misunderstanding of science and then you just have activists who just want you to bow to them all the time. Are you able to sort of quantify how much of the backlash is each? I think to be charitable, I try to look at the other side and give them you know, credit and try to you know, think that they have good intentions. Maybe people, I mean, it's pretty consistent. All 11 studies ever done on the topic of desistance, so this phenomenon I talked about where kids grow out of their feelings of gender dysphoria, all of them say the same thing. So the final statistic is about 60 to 90%. So this is the vast majority of kids. You can't really question those data. Mm -hmm. So I think what it could be is people, I mean, trans people have a history of having to deal with medical gatekeeping of people telling them they don't really, what they feel isn't real. I do think gender dysphoria is a real phenomenon and I do think we should have empathy for people who are suffering. Um, so I think it could be coming from that of, of that place of, well, we don't want people saying that this isn't a legitimate thing or that trans people should be forced to not feel the way they do. But um, in terms of you know these children, we should be thinking about the best outcome. So it doesn't make sense for them to transition if that's not actually going to help them in the long term. I, I try to give people the benefit of the doubt, but I do think the activists, they, on some level, I think they know that they can bully sex researchers because of that history. They know that there's only so much an academic can do and they've won a couple battles. So I think that's part of it as well. How shocking was it to you when you were discussing this with colleagues? Um, that they were kind of hinting you may want to wait on this thing. I mean, did you think that you'd be in that situation? And I'm, I'm wondering, did any of them sit on some other things because they were afraid too? Hmm. It was eye-opening, yeah. Um, but I, I kind of knew. Um, one, one, I guess, instance I can talk about is one colleague, Michael Bailey at Northwestern University, he wrote a book that upset transgender activists. Um, and they went off after him ruthlessly. I mean, they really tried to destroy his life. And thankfully, you know, he's, he's still considered one of the foremost experts in sexology internationally. But I would say that, you know, I've written about him previously. I, I think he's kind of been the poster boy as to why people are really terrified to say anything that goes against the trans narrative. Yeah, so I think you've already hinted at this and I know your work otherwise, but so you have no issue with trans people as people, just no. to be clear. This is purely about the science related to transitioning and hormone blockers and things of that nature of a certain age, where they're doing it as young as, I think you were writing about 14, right? Oh, younger than that now? Well, yeah. yeah, I mean, if there's parental consent, definitely, and I have to say for transgender adults, and I'd say even kids who reach puberty and still feel that way, I think transitioning is, is totally up to you. If that's what the path you decide to go, then power to you. 
I yeah. don't think there's anyone's any it's anyone's business to tell you what to do at that point. So are there basic parameters related to age then? Well, there are in terms of so I don't work with children. I don't do clinical work anymore. But um, in terms of the research literature, usually clinicians will wait until puberty and, and see how the child feels at that time when the body starts changing, when they start having crushes on their peers and that kind of thing. And the research does show that um, when kids start to you know have crushes and start dating and that can play a role in terms of how they feel about their bodies and whether they do outgrow it. But just at that point, your whole body is in flux. Your mental state's in flux, your physical state's in flux. And as you said, what, what did you say a percentage on that of how many of them turn out to just, they have to be 60 to 90, so yeah. So, they, so 60 to 90% of the, the children undergoing these feelings turn out to be gay. Mm -hmm. And then I assume the ones that don't transition, probably most of them end up being okay with being gay, mm -hmm. I would imagine, roughly. Yeah, and I would, I would say even, like, I grew up in the gay community, I have a lot of gay male friends, and they've said to me when I was young, I told my parents all the time I hated being a boy and I wanted to be a girl, and I am a girl, and why can't I become a girl? And now as a gay man, I'm so comfortable, I'm so happy, and they say to me, you know, I'm, I'm kind of glad I'm not growing up in this time because I think I probably would have transitioned. Yeah, well, that's why the, the external pressure seems so crazy to me because you just don't know at that at that age. And even if you do know, waiting a little bit isn't gonna, for the science to flesh out, mm -hmm. it's, it's not, that's not gonna kill you. Mm -hmm. It's just hard talking about this even, you know? Yeah, I mean, the thing is, what people also aren't talking about is that for these kids, in some cases, the parents don't want a gay child. And this is what upsets me the most. So if you have a little boy who's very feminine, he's likely gonna grow up to be a gay man. But if you take that same little boy and allow mm. him to transition to female, when he grows up, he's gonna to appear to be a straight woman. And so these parents are being lauded as progressive when really they're homophobic. Oh God, how perverse that is. That, that's interesting what you just said about a certain amount of gay men that grow up, you know, they wanted to be, a, or felt more mm -hmm. like a girl or whatever, and then eventually grow out and we were okay. Because I never felt that. Like I played sports and I played video games and Transformers, mm -hmm. all, the, all the things that my friends did. And I never felt like I was a girl or, more effeminate. People always say to me, I don't seem gay. And I'm always like, I don't know what that, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> I'm married to a guy. Yeah. You know what I mean? That's pretty gay. But I never had that. But that that's sort of just interesting about the psychology mm -hmm. of gay people in general. There are gay people that grow up feeling very effeminate, and mm -hmm. there are gay men that grow up not feeling that way. And I'm sure there's women that grow up feeling very butch or whatever. And there's women that grow up that are, you know, lipstick lesbians yeah. and, and the whole thing. Have you done any research on any, on any of that? Uh, in terms of my research, no, but in terms of what studies have shown, it is about hormone levels in utero. So testosterone, if you are exposed to higher levels of testosterone in utero, you're more likely to be male typical and masculine when you're born. So whether you're male or female. So most boys are exposed to high levels of testosterone. So that explains when they're born, why they are interested in male typical toys and activities. Um, so for gay men, they were likely exposed to lower levels of testosterone, which is why they're more feminine. And the same with, with girls, if they're exposed to higher levels of testosterone, they're more likely to be masculine and lesbian. Right, even though there's obvious outliers. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, to, this is on average, on sure. average, yeah. yeah. Is, is there a danger in talking about that? Because I would imagine that the certain amount of people in the gay community that would want you to never go down that road because then you could end up in a place where, oh, we would be able to uh, prevent people from being mm -hmm. gay, ultimately, if we can really figure out the science behind all this. Definitely, and I mean, as a straight woman, I have to say, I, even I right now feel like maybe I shouldn't be saying these things because I'm not gay, I can't speak for the gay community, but as a former sex researcher, I, I'm very much a proponent of uh, I'd rather you speak as a sex <laughs> researcher than a gay person or a straight person or anything else. I mean, this yeah. is this is the problem, though. You're, you're you know what I mean? Like it you're you're an data. expert th yeah. in this, and it's like even for you, who's so brave on all of these issues. It gets weird to talk about, and even for me, I just, it's like a little weird to talk about it. Do you it feel just, like a traitor? No, I, I <laughs> am what I am, and that's all that I am, yeah. that's it. But like, I know that just even talking about this just gets people crazy, and yeah. I know what our, our what our Twitter feeds are gonna look like oh, yeah. after this. You yeah, know? you get ready. Yeah. So, I mean, I, it's crazy because even my colleagues who have the best intentions, they're doing this research because they just wanna understand why are people the way they are? It's not, there are no nefarious intentions there, but people are so quick to jump on. I mean, there was, 
Earlier this year, there was a study about using AI to be able to detect whether someone is gay by looking at their face. And so, again, studies have shown that, on average, you can see differences between straight and gay people, both men and women, uh, in terms of facial features. And so everyone's freaking out about this study. And I'm thinking, why aren't we saying this is amazing that we are able to know this? And I mean, I think I have really good gaydar. I've always yeah. thought I have. And now I think, great, like there's actually some quantitative data to, to suggest that I'm not just making things up. Right, and they're also, they always say, well, gay guys have gaydar, that mm -hmm. there's something else that maybe you can see or whatever it is. Or they'll, they're, I don't know that people say it anymore, but people used to say gay face. Like there's just <laughs> something about the facial features yeah. sometimes of gay men. Maybe they were a little softer or wh whatever yeah. it is. I don't even know what it is. But like people were talking about that in the gay community, then it comes out through some sort of science lens and it's like, whoa, mm -hmm. we better watch out for that. And the thing is then researchers see that and say, well, I don't wanna go through that. So then they don't wanna touch that topic. So now there's there are eventually gonna be only like two different things you can probably study. Unless yeah. you know that what your findings, what you're gonna find is gonna be politically acceptable, in which case you shouldn't be doing the research because that means you're not actually doing science.